What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Tribe of Millionaires podcast from GoBundance. I'm your host, Jamie Gruber. And today I welcomed in GoBundance brother, Josh McCallan. This guy, man, ball of energy, smart, driven, successful entrepreneur, and dad of a lot of people. A lot of people. What do you hear how many kids this guy has and, and how he even operates in life to me blows me away when he's got like X next to the number of children above how many children I have. But Josh talks a lot about his, his foray into the hospitality business. And he really looks at what he does as hospitality, even though he owns and operates wineries and those sorts of things in New Jersey. Unbelievable businessman. And he's done incredible things there. He dives deep into his story. He gets very vulnerable at times, even sharing that he's never shared some of the stuff that he talked about in this episode. So you got to check that out. Remember, be sure to like, subscribe, Drop a comment. Let us know what you think of Josh McAllen. Josh McAllen, brother, great to have you on. Well, but thank you so much, Jamie. And yes, the, uh, the, the chance to spend time with you on the Capital Hacking Show was awesome. Everybody who hasn't heard Capital Hacking has to listen to it. But in the meantime, uh, I've been looking forward to getting on the show for a long, long time. But then I, I get to be on right after you rebranded it. So... Now I'm like even doubly honored. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Tribe of millionaires we are now. And that's what we are essentially. So it's been, uh, it's, it seemed like the right move to make, to make it, uh, make, to rebrand the show from Go Bundles to Tribe of Millionaires matches the book. It's just marketing genius. I like it. <laughs> well, that's you, right? I mean, yeah, you're part me. of that All team. Me. 100% oh, yeah. me. Nobody else. Nobody else. But let's get your background. So you are, uh, if, from what I know, you're in New Jersey. Am I, am I wrong on that? Uh, all over the Eastern Seaboard, one assets in New Jersey. I'm in Philadelphia, my home base, where there's a ton of Go Abundance brothers. John there Edwin, is. of course, Mark McGuire, so many. Tons of them, Sergio. So, what's your backstory? Where Where are you from, Philly? Give us kind of the the, yeah. the three to five minute uh, backstory of you. So, on the back of a napkin, yeah. If you're hearing my voice, you're probably like, "Is that the guy with the ten kids?" Yes, I'm that guy with the ten kids. Uh, I remember when I joined Go Abundance early on in 18. Uh, and then right after that, joined the winter event with uh, Mike McCarthy. Uh, and I had nine kids at the time and we thought that was a lot, but now we're to double digits, world-class numbers. And uh, anyway, I remember going to that family fan abundance event that first year and him talking all about how our legacy of our children is our treasure. And I'm thinking, man, I'm a billionaire then baby. I'm like a billionaire of babies. So anyway, um, my backstory is one of those, a lot like probably 90 plus percent of the guys in the GoBundance, super poverty slash humble beginnings. Grew up a little bit of my time was on welfare with my poor mom being handicapped. One brother, thank God, we call him Uncle Pete now because he's got a lot of nephews and nieces. Uncle Pete went in the military. I went into business, uh, had a parlay, a little bit of time in the education. I was a teacher for a while, but now... Uh, you guys probably know me as uh, someone who builds out resorts. Many of you have been to some of our resorts. Primarily the one that most of you know me for is the Renault Winery Resort in New Jersey. But we also have some uh, more we're acquiring now. We have another one in Annapolis. So today, uh, I think of myself in three ways. You know, we have investors from all over the world, 300 plus active investors, 1,500 active in, you know, in the club. Um, we're called that, we call that accountable equity. And then of course my day job and what, what I was born to do was Viva May hospitality, which was uh, this idea of turnaround business operations for resorts based on one principle that is the name is our mission. We are here to revive the soul. And that's what Viva May means. And those are like my stories. You know, I have a lot of stories related to that and uh, I'm all yours, whatever you want to know. I've been. Well, I want to go back to, you mentioned uh, uh, extreme poverty as a child, the handicapped mother. What was the situation at home? If you can bring me back to that time. When you say poverty, give us a little bit more context there. Yeah. I mean, poverty. So look, to me, poverty is this. You know, of course, I got, I had a roof. Thank the good Lord. Not that. So poverty is probably too strong of a word, but everything but a roof we did not have, right? And when we, we uh, made like a 12 inch black and white TV with that antenna. Uh, one of the reasons I, I look back now and I'm like, you know what? I don't remember hearing about free lunches in schools until the 90s, but in the late 70s, early 80s, I was getting the free lunch at school because they were taking pity on me. It was a Catholic school, and they I remember going through the lunch line every day. My friends were like, man, how does your dad and mom buy you lunch every day? Of course, I didn't have a dad at the time, but I always used to just kind of hide it. I'm like, oh, you know, I think, I think they pay in advance, but really what it was was they had so much mercy on us, so we would get that free lunch every day. 
Um, I was a hustler from an early on age, just like most of the GoBundance people. I always was trying to sell something. I remember selling cotton candy as a grade school kid because my big Christmas present was a, a plastic cotton candy maker. Um, and then early on working, you know, back in the day, you could be a paper boy. This is the eighties. Paper boy is the ultimate entrepreneurial background. Uh, we could talk about that some other time, but you have to hustle from six in the morning on, and then you have to go collect your paycheck literally door to door. It's like the best, it's the ultimate gig for uh, learning how to, to hustle and own your own business. So all that kind of stuff was my background. Makes sense. What, if, if you don't mind me asking, you said dad, not in the picture. Is there, is there yeah. more to that? Did he, did he pass or was he just, no, that wasn't around? You know, again, I don't, this part of my story is quite normal. I think he was a nice enough guy, but got divorced from my poor mom early on. They probably were not right for each other. So I think they got divorced when I was probably four and a half, five. So I know him as the guy we would see on the weekends every once in a while. And then, you know, finances for him were mediocre at best. He was actually not, um, not an entrepreneur, but a very creative dude back in the day when commercial photography was done with a camera, not a, you know, commercial, commercial graphics were done with cameras and like st staging. Um, and he was really, really talented apparently, but, uh, he did actually pass really young though at 60 years old. So he's been gone for a while now. I'm going to ask if any relationship today, but sorry for so my condolences for that, for your loss. Yeah. Um, as a dad now of 10 kids, and when you think back to a dad who, uh, I guess biologically was there, but wasn't a dad, he was a father, not a dad or a dad, not a father, however, you whatever, want to either that, way, right? <laughs> um, I, I gotta believe, do you, do you, does that shape you at all as a father? Is there, so. is there influence and what is that? Yeah. That, I hope you don't mind me going deep real quick here. So Please. I grew up after, after the poverty thing, I ended up being a great moneymaker. You know, I made a lot of money in high school making, you, if you want to work in high school, you get tip jobs, you get hourly rate jobs. I did them all. I probably worked on average almost 40 hours a week while going to high school. So I, now I had plenty of money by the time I was uh, driving my own car and everything. Still working, loved it. Um, normal dude you know a uh, promiscuous guy always trying to party big drinker anyway so around 18 i don't ever share this with anybody in go bonnets but around 18 i had broken so many rules at home for my poor little mom she was my poor little mom never worked again since 27 she had a stroke but she was my mom right so i wow. lived at home i took care of her one time i went out with my girlfriend for like five days and she was like you're not allowed to do that you're going on a religious retreat because you got to straighten yourself up. So I go on this retreat, which I never had done before. And during that retreat, I did actually uh, change my ways. And it was all based on one talk. You, you might like this. So there's this one talk. I'm making fun of the retreats the whole weekend. I'm that funny guy in the back, everybody's buddy. And this one lady gets up and she goes, if you're having sex with a bunch of people, you're basically practicing to get divorced because sex has chemical, emotional connections, and you're getting really good at breaking them. Then good luck. You're going to be a divorcee someday. And I was like, shit, man, that made a lot of sense to me. And I remember thinking, I, if it made sense to me, and then they said, if it makes sense to you, why don't you, you know, ask God to su support you if you try to change your ways. So I, I, at 18, I was like, man, I'm not going to do that. I don't want to get divorced. This is the worst part of my deal, man. I used to like my life except for the divorce part. So I, I just started to, to uh, have a faith life all of a sudden at 18 out of the blue. And then that just influenced the rest of my life. You know, I kind of, um, normal guy, but I always just believed that there could be a higher calling and a higher opportunity to life and translate that over the course of 40 more, you know, what, 30 more years since then almost. Um, I've had a really great list of opportunities that kind of just kind of unfolded because I kept stepping in both faith. You know, I had a lot of courage and a lot of fear, fearlessness, because that's just, I always felt like you might as well just take that risk, whether it be take a job, ask somebody out, whatever. So I had a strong control of fear in my heart. I wasn't too afraid of things. And then I had some faith where I thought things could, you know, things had a purpose. Um, and then my eyes just opened up to the beauty of, you know, humanity and, um, you know, the dignity of the person. So over years, I just kind of walked down that path and have had some of the world's best opportunities since then. Really, really, really great opportunities for the last 30 years. You've, uh, you're a hustler. 
defined yeah. by your your youth, right? When you were when yep. you were uh, uh, in the, as a paper boy and everything. You know, today you've built you know you've built a a, a, a good life for yourself, right? You're, you're oh, yeah. successful by most stretches, uh, by most uh, people's uh, uh, definitions, I should say. So so. Is there imbalance there for you at all? Like, is that is that your early trauma that you went through of being sort of poor and having to build yourself up? Do you, do you is there anything you sacrifice today? Do you think as a result? I can imagine, like, you're always going from what I see. Oh you. yeah, yeah. Is there downtime, <laughs> or do you are you you got ten kids? Like, you know, how do you balance that, or do you, or is that just something uh, that you're still working through? No, yeah, yeah. One of the cool things about your the pillars of GoBundance is that whole idea of bucket list adventures and extreme, yeah. you know, not only extreme accountability, but you know, great relationships. Um, authentic ones. I think those are where I struggle. You know, I'm pretty comfortable. I'm a, I love people, man. I yeah. love people. I want to be around people. I want to help people, but I'm also kind of a little independent and a bit of a loner. Isn't that weird? I don't ever say that, but I'm a bit of a loner. So, uh, one of the cool things about having a podcast co-host capital hacking with Eric Cabral is I really love that guy. I love that guy, Eric Cabral. And, and I, so ge- he's so generous with his heart and time that I feel like He's helping me become a better friend. Uh, like I'm a good, I believe I'm a good friend. If you need anything, just call me. I'll help you. But uh, I'm, I would say I have a lot of work to do on making time for other friends. Clearly somebody, you, you're you on the other end of the mic. You're like, bro, don't you have 10 kids and a wife? I'm like, yes, I do. But it is where your focus goes, your energy flows, right? So I think... If anything, uh, my, the traumas were very independent, very much a loner. I would say, a loner. Hmm, it's weird because I'm with people all the time, but I can see that I'm not a great, great deep friend, which is too bad because I have the heart for it. I just, I don't know. There's a missing link there, kind of like you were telling me earlier. There's something I got to break through. You and yeah. I should go to one of those breakthrough seminars together. We should. I got to figure have, it out. Yeah, we were talking prior to recording about uh, this. The weekend after this recording, I'm going to something called Landmark Forums, which is a personal development retreat. And and you asked me a great question, like, what's the intention for you, for me, meaning going into yeah. going through this? And I had said, yeah, I, you know, I feel like I've done so much. Abundance has been such an influence on me. I feel like I've grown so much, but there's this like this netting above me, and I, I'm trying to find the hole to rip through it. There's just something I feel like I'm not breaking through, and I'm I'm yeah. hoping that uh, I'll find that here. And you talked about a Tony Robbins event that you went to that yeah. kind of was down that path. And, uh, it's interesting for you to say that about, about friendship. Cause yeah, I wouldn't have pegged it just, you know, we don't know each other extremely well, but enough to say, this is a gregarious outgoing people focused yeah. guy, the service that you provide to others, be it financially or whatever, by investing with you, all of that stuff that feels like a focus of yours, but you're not alone. I mean, Brandon Turner talks about being kind of a, a loner as well, even though he's an outgoing guy, it, what is, how does that show up? What does that look like being a loner? So if you're in a group of people, how are you a loner? Cause you're around so many people all the time. How do you define that for you? Is it just inside you're feeling maybe a, a wall that you build around yourself? You're not going to go to a yeah. certain place or you don't follow up with people after the fact, like great in the moment, but I'm not the follow through guy. I'm not calling you every week. Like, what does that look like? What's a loner? Hey, everybody who's listening to this and I'm hoping a ton of you guys, uh, one uh, would like, I would like to call friends. Uh, please don't judge me for this. No. Yeah. That is probably what it is. Is I, I, in the moment I'm all yours. I'm hundred percent focused. Um, probably, probably struggle with follow-up on relationships and, or just the nurturing of relationships. Like here's one thing that I'd really admire about great people. And <laughs> what someday I want to be a great people is the people that literally will just pull their phone up and they're like, you know what? It's time for me to call Johnny or Sam or real or whoever. And it's in their heart, in their mind, and they do it. Mm. I am not intentionally not doing it. Okay. <laughs> it's yeah. definitely not like, oh, I better never call that dude again or whatever. It's just never showing up in my consciousness. My wife says that I have this strength and weakness, and that is tomorrow I really will move on from today very definitively. So every previous day from today, I do not give it for the, this is probably a strength. I don't give it any power, right? I'm ready to fight today. And tomorrow I wake up, I'm like ready to fight again, whatever that fight is or that struggle. So I tend to not live in the past. As a matter of fact, if you just ask me for great stories from my kids and you're like, man, you're with your kids a lot. Tell me some great stories. I'm like, shit. What? Uh, well, there was that <laughs> thing. And I'm like literally with them all the time when I'm not at work. And it's, I struggle to have like a reconnaissance of memories. Um, 
because I'm so focused on right this minute. I have a task list of 12 things. You and I are having this killer conversation. So I'm like hyper focused on the moment. Yeah. Seriously, go work goal oriented. And I just tend to lose track of what I, the gifts I was given yesterday. And the problem with that, see, a lot of times that's a good thing, but uh, the problem is, is the relationships of all the gifts of all the relationships. They need me to remember. I need to remember. I need to nurture them. So anyway, I don't know. That's like you, Dr. Phil asking me and you're getting me to say things I've never said before. I've never said that, but I think that's actually accurate. Is this whole move on kind of fight another day thing? Like my wife's like everything she chronicles in my life. She's like, shit, that was pretty hard. That happened to you. I'm like, yeah, that happened. It never had power over me. Very few things have power over me in the negative. Anyway. So maybe I also don't feel the highs as high. Uh, that unlocks like 20 questions, but I'll ask this. How are you held back? When you say you're present with people in the moment, I, that's absolutely, you are spot on. You have a, an accurate self-evaluation of you. Right now, the times I spent with you, always like right there. So if you're not somebody who follows up, let's say, and you know cultivates the relationship after the fact, how is that hurting you? Because being present to me is extremely important. It's probably maybe more important because there's a lot of times I know I'm not, I'm, I'm glad handing and I'm being the, the high eye and the disc model in the room, high five and hey, what's up? You know, the Jerry Maguire part of me, right? <laughs> but then I might follow up later, but still like I'm not maybe present in that moment. I mean, is it, is it, do you feel like it's held you back from anything? Are there any maybe examples of that that you feel like by not cultivating a relationship or following through, it's held you back in some way? Look, I mean, I think, yeah, here I am. You, you may not know this, but I give a lot of talks on hospitality and why we're so committed to it and how powerful it is for the good of people and your heart. And I totally mean it and I totally live it. And so that's why I'm very present in the moment. <clears throat> One of the things, though, is if you're not nurturing long term relationships, uh, I think your question is how's it holding me back? Yeah. Is that your question? Okay. Pretty much. I think yeah. it's holding me back because. Um, there's first of all it may look disingenuous a little bit you know so tomorrow or today you and i are having this killer conversation tomorrow i don't hang out with you and i'm sorry because you're awesome i wish i could hang out with you more i, I would like it if you and i should we should hang out more right and you might say dude that dude was all awesome yesterday but he didn't follow up today i don't know if he was telling the truth yesterday like that may happen to a lot of people when they deal with me you know, um, and I feel bad because my wife will tell you, no, dude, he's, he's dead serious. He really meant it. He really means it. He really will do it. Uh, but, um, people almost think I'm not genuine because when I'm with you, I'm like a hundred percent focused on you. Yeah. So I think it probably creates a very big confusion for me <laughs> later That's on. Yeah. You know, and it probably does. I don't think about that so much. I think more from my point of view is that it's the right thing to do is to be generous to others. And uh, I hope I'm answering that question. Okay. You are, maybe, you are. Maybe, no, I, I, it, it means something to me because I, I, I've talked a couple of times. About, I mean, I'm still stuck with, you know, God knows how many missed texts and non-return calls and all of that stuff. I feel you. Like I, I, I do a lot of in the moment stuff and I enjoy conversations like this and, you know, like, yeah, tomorrow you might text and might, maybe I reply once you reply back. And then all of a sudden it's lost in a boulevard of broken texts, you know, and then they send another <laughs> one like, Oh, I got to get to that guy. And now it's just weird. Now I've gotten to like three, four and I'm like, ah, if I follow up now, like I, it's like Uber apology. So I feel you. I just wonder that you, you know, you being as present as you are and have had, having had the success you've had, um, you know, are we too hard on ourselves sometimes? On, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. You know? This is a Dr. Phil show. So we are being a little hard on both of ourselves right now, but <laughs> those are some of the struggles I struggle through. I mean, I think of go abundance since we're on the famous world, famous go abundance show tribe of millionaires. I am, I have been tremendously challenged by go abundance mm. and that's a good thing, right? I mean, it just never has been easy for me. Go abundance. It's like, I like it. I totally am on board with the curriculum or whatever. I've always thought Mike McCarthy, when he was the, he was kind of the head of it when I got in and he's just an compelling presenter and the way he asked the appreciative inquiry process. I, I was like, these guys are on to something. And yet I definitely know I'm not living up to the six pillars. I definitely know I'm not living up to all the incredible authentic relationships I should be building. So it's funny how committed I am to it and how much I want to bring more people to it. Because I definitely do not feel like, man, you nailed it at Go Bundance. You're doing a great job there. I feel like I'm really like a 15 out of 20, uh, 15 out of 100. 
I'm like a sub 50 percenter here at uh, Go Bunnets. And, and you might say, well, then quit. No, I'm not quitting. It's three years into it. I'm going to fight through this. And someday I'll be Jamie Gruber. <laughs> <laughs> the opposite. The opposite is what I'm looking for. My my oh. aspirations are behind you. If you're watching on YouTube, like that's the guy I want to be. Look at what you're. Oh. We're going to go into this in a second here and talk about some of the resorts and everything. But I think it would be it would be uh, irresponsible of me as a podcast host to walk past ten kids and not dive in for a second on that. So oh yeah, go ahead. Anything ten you got. kids. Ten kid. Is this uh, just uh, you know? Hey religious like you know I, I 10 kids why yeah, you gotta ask why that question. Good question. why 10 gets a lot of people <laughs> it is a lot of people and most people um ask me mormon right i'm like no nah, i'm not mormon but um it's two reasons one i'm one of two so i was not planning on having a big family my wife was one of 10 wow so that that gave her the inclination to want a big family because she did have a really cool upbringing. Her dad was in the military and they traveled the country and just, they just were a killer family. So she had a really great experience from a big family. But what I always say is uh, thank God for Melanie. Cause it's much harder to be a woman having 10 kids. I am happy to oblige if she would like more kids. It's always fun and easy for me. So uh, on my side, I love having 10 kids. Now I like making them and I yeah. like being with them. And I'm I'm really into it. I got six ladies and four dudes. Wow! I got a, our tenth baby was just a year and a half ago. We're late. We're mid forties now, and he is um, he's a great little dude. So I, I haven't had, we haven't had a boy baby in like ten years. So <laughs> it was mostly ladies there for a while. And I love my ladies. Years. Yeah. How many? Uh, what's the age range? Uh, twenty one year old lady to one year old dude. Wow. How do you get time? How do you possibly I, I, I have two boys and then I had everything chopped off. It wasn't even vasectomy. I just, <laughs> everything was removed. Two kids, no sleepless nights. I don't need anything anymore. Like it's fine. Like no pleasure. I'm good with it, but um, I'm kidding. Of course. But the, I the, actually don't know how kidding you are. Are you not kidding? Are you kidding? Or are you not kidding? Just a vasectomy. That's okay. it. I, I you kept all the hard thing off. For I, God no, I kept sakes it. It's still, over here. It's still there. I like to go, you know, all the way one way or the other, but this one, I went in the middle and I just got a regular vasectomy, but um to one republic music by the way funny story the doctor was like would you like music it was very like <laughs> dim lighting it was yeah it was <laughs> that you smell burning and stuff it's weird uh anyway so so uh, i don't know i struggle sometimes getting time with my two boys right yeah. being able to spend yeah. quality time with my two boys What's going on, everybody? It's Jamie. I'm jumping in real quick here because some people are listening to this podcast thinking, man, I hear this guest. I hear what they're talking about. This whole go abundance thing sounds pretty cool. I'd love to be a part of that. And I would say to you, if you are qualified to be part of GoBundance, you're a millionaire or accredited at the very least, jump on to GoBundance.com and just put your application in. You'll get on a call. It might even be with me where we can talk about what you're trying to do, what you're trying to accomplish, and what it is to be part of this community in depth. Would love to have a conversation with you about that. It's been just so life changing for me. And for those of you out there that are saying, yeah, sounds great. I would if I were a millionaire or if I were accredited, but I'm not there yet. We've got that now. We've built a program and I run it. I love, love being a part of it. I left my job for it called Emerge and Ascend. Emerge is where you got to start. It's a 12 week intensive sprint goal setting course. You're going to get curriculum every week. You're going to get live intervention every week. You're going to get connection with GoBundance members every week. You're going to get accountability from like minded people every week. Jump into that, kill it, and we invite you to ascend, which is essentially the GoBundance mastermind without the million dollar requirement. And we actually even add in coaching to help folks find their purpose, their mission, their values. It's intense. It's, it's everything all wrapped in one. So again, if you're a millionaire or you're at least accredited and you're wondering about this GoBundance thing and that should I, shouldn't I, just apply. Throw your name in. You lose nothing. All you do is put your name into an application form. You get on a phone call and then you decide. If you're not yet at that million dollar mark, look at Emerge. GoBundance.com slash Emerge. And what you can do as well is drop my name in there, Jamie, J-A-M-I-E, and we'll knock 200 bucks off the tuition for Emerge. Jump in there and we'll get you started on your journey toward being a whole life millionaire, toward getting to go abundance, whatever you want. People in Emerge, people in Ascend, people in Go Abundance all report back often the changes it's made in their lives financially, relationally, and everywhere else. So 
Go to GoBundance.com. Check all of that out. See wherever you are. Dive into that particular area of GoBundance, and we'd love to see you inside of the tribe. Now, back to our show. I mean, that's the obvious question here. What do you do? Or maybe you, you just, it's impossible. Yeah. You use kids to spend quality time with other kids. Like, yeah, how do you do this? At, at yeah. Scale? There's on scale for yeah. anybody who runs a business, which is 99.9% .9 of us go bonus people. Yeah. It's similar. I, I would say it's kind of similar. Like, um, so here's what I mean. They, they, first of all, we try to train into them the old, well, we don't train. We actually try to live like old fashioned baby boomer parents. Like, like it's okay to get hurt and figure it out yourself. And if you want money, I don't have any, go get some, um, all those kinds of old traits that actually made America great. Again, we're just normal. Just you're okay to fall off that swing. I'm not that worried about you. You'll be fine. Are you broken arm? Okay. Let's go to the hospital. Nothing's that bad here. It, it, it's kind of like everything is the way it used to be when you and I were growing up, like you're allowed to get hurt. So since that you take the pressure of helicopter parenting off now you've got like so much less stress to be honest mm. with you then you have the stress of the normal stresses and making sure you have you know, whatever for them but they they do support each other and i get to watch that so then it's my job to lead them we have a funny expression in the house called momentum making and momentum making is when you send a few of the troublemakers out to sit in the car and wait until the others get going and then you say to the rest of them they're already in the car. You got to get in the car. You know, you just kind of start creating momentum <laughs> and uh, yelling's fine. We're okay with yelling at our house. It's probably not appropriate, but um, the, we are doing, I am doing scheduled dates with the ladies and I call them dude dates with the dudes um, when we do, do do them. And we're, I think I've only gotten to one for everybody this year, which is not great, but those ones mean so much. Yeah. And then another thing is, when I'm not working, I try to always have some kids with me. Mm. And even with a, if I have a chance to take them with me, like on a trip to go look at properties to buy, I will. And it, that actually helped one time. I, we were looking at a resort about Virginia area, and the dude was pissed that I brought some kids. I'm like, well, don't worry. We're buying your resort. You don't have to worry about my kids. If we buy yeah. it, we buy it. Yeah. But he was so old school. He thought a resort owner had to be aristocratic because it was a gorgeous resort we were trying to buy. And he was mad that I was keeping it real. Like I was like, well, here's how the numbers are working. I don't see this working. I, I, we were all real. And I wanted to get to know him. I wanted to understand his heart. And I could tell no matter what I was asking, the only reason he didn't want to sell me the property, he actually said that was because I, I wasn't aristocratic. I'm like, well, don't worry. I'm not here to be, I always say to people we, when we try to buy resorts, good news is, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, you are aristocratic. Well, what I don't say that. You have a couple choices here. You could sell it to some gentrified resort owner that wants to have this as a trophy and you can charge them whatever you can charge them and good luck. Mm -hmm. Great news is I'm not that guy. We bet we're backed by hundreds of investors. They all need a great return. As long as the numbers work, we will buy your resort because because we wouldn't be here if it didn't fit a lot of the criteria. And so my point is, um, the kids keep it real. I do try to bring them with me. And if if I'm home and it's like a Saturday and mom's burned out like crazy burned out, I'll just take them and say, "What errands do you want done? Let's go." I used to go furniture shopping a lot for her, and because we're always fi finishing out a flip house or a big resort, and I'm always buying eclectic stuff. So. I'll take them with me, man. And they, they're learning. They're learning as they go. That's funny. That's been a big go abundance uh, thing for me is, is how I treat my children. Cause we grew up in a similar era, right? Don't talk about money in front of your kids. Um, you know, kids are maybe seen, not heard all of that stuff. And we've morphed into, yeah, money conversations are open. I actually talked oh, yeah. to a guy the other day about potentially joining GoBundance, and he goes, "Oh, hold on, I got to get away from my kid. I don't talk money in front of him." I'm like, ah, that that'll change, right? If you yeah. join GoBundance, that'll change. Um, and even you know, I interviewed for this podcast a guy named Matt Bodro, not a GoBundance guy, but he talked about uh, alternative education, and uh, he had a uh, they have guide rails or guardrails for their kids, and we actually have them as well. And I copied this one. I put it on our list of guardrails, which was don't complain, just fix it. Your baby boomer parenting yes. mindset, right? Like. Yes. yes, your arm is broken. Let's go fix it. Yeah, the, the Lego thing fell apart. How do you fix it, right? As opposed to complaining about it. Uh, yep. So it makes a lot of sense. And to, to my point, to the point you were making, being around people that are prioritizing a, a more, I think, impactful way to raise their kids, 
dates with the kids, dates with the dudes or whatever, right? That whole thing. It just makes a ton of sense. So really, really cool, man. That's a, uh, that's a lot of human beings. So good for you. That it you're really- yeah. It answers the question why we're in the resort business and why we have so many staff in the resort business. I was like, we're becomes- in the people business. Oh, you're a great podcast host in your own right, because that is the natural segue here. So I'm assuming that you're throwing papers at the Smith's house and collecting 250 a week from them on Friday. Yep. And then the next day you're buying resorts. Yep. How do you get to, <laughs> what is this, what is this resort buying thing that you do? Give me, give me the, the yeah. like, how did it start? And what are the resorts Are you buying? Like, Bo- oceanfront Mexican villas. Yeah. Like, what are you buying? What are resorts that you? Yeah, yeah. Doing? We have a geography. Wow. You, if you give me a few minutes, I will tell you the whole business plan in one minute, a few minutes. But, but it started with, um, yeah, that's a romantic beginning, as we say in the podcast business. So the romantic beginning was Melanie and I are now married. Let's fa- backwards to the year two thousand. We're married three or four years. We have one little baby, maybe two on the way. Seconds on the way. We live in Europe. Hmm. Actually, no, now we live in Europe in 2002 in the Alps, right right where Maria von Trapp would have been singing her ass off. That's why you had so many kids. Maria von Trapp. She was the part six, of the business. The yes. six, <laughs> six kids or whatever, The Sound yeah, of Music. Isn't that The Sound of Music? music. Get, okay, the good. Best. By the way, yeah, yeah the best movie, even if you're a dude, you should check it out. I love it's it. It's a great movie. Yeah. The Nazis are coming and yep. the world's changing. Hello. So what do you it's do? You sing and dance. Cool. That's what no, happened. So we're, right I'm now. working over there uh, running a resort, actually, at the time. It was kind of a hybrid between running a resort and selling the space to students. Anyway, I'm there for four years, learn a lot of German, barely come back to America. And so when that's coming to an end, it's the four-year contract. Melanie's like, what the hell are we going to do when we get back to America? You're almost mm-hmm. 30 now. I'm like, I, I, I'm, I know what I'm going to do. She's like, what? I'm going to be a land developer. And she goes, how the hell are you going to be a land developer, man? You don't know shit about that. And I'm like, well, it's, it's on my heart, man. I know I'm supposed to be a land developer. And uh, we've been re- I was a big advocate of reading The Economist magazine while I lived in Europe and Wall Street Journal in English, of course, not in German. And uh, I got home and I said, I'm going to become a land developer. And guess what? It's very hard to transition back from Europe when you're not in land development to get yeah. into land development. But I found a way through. Um, I became a lender. And then as a lender, I knew who the developers were. And then I just pitched myself to dozens of developers and I pitched strategies to sell more townhouses and whatever. And I'd love to work with you guys directly, blah, 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 blah. Like about the, I would say the 10th person, actually the fifth person while I was moving through the whole process, kept sticking around, but couldn't give me a deal. He's like, but I like you a lot. So he then introduced me to a few other people. And by the time he introduced me to this 10th person, um, I was actually ready to give up. It was about a year since we got back from Europe. We'd burned through our savings. I'm a sales guy, loan broker, not making enough. I wasn't very good at it, I guess, even though I loved it. Uh, But I knew I was supposed to be a land developer. Bottom line, I meet up with a dude who had just had a couple hundred million dollar liquidity event. And honestly, that was a big change in my life. You know, I I learned how the rich think, kind of like rich dad poured out it in real life. He ended up hiring me um, and I moved into his business now which was high-end flips, $5 million flips on the water in New Jersey for New Yorkers and Philadelphians. And the most expensive one I was ever part of was $12.5 million for one house. Oh, and wow. so what happened was I was just like an analyst at first. And then I was project manager, go down and help build the buildings an hour and a half away. I'm like, yeah, I'll figure out how to do that. Then the contractors would stop showing up, like the GC. And then you'd have painters and carpenters saying, what am I supposed to be doing? Then I'm opening up the plans calling the architects, calling the engineers saying, wait a second, how are we supposed to get this done? And I'm just telling them. So get fast forward a couple of years. I'm like a legit multi-million dollar general contractor because mother of invention is necessity. There was not, the GCs never showed up. You know, they were on contract, but it was the boom era. It was this 2000s, man. They had 10 jobs going when they should have only had two of these fancy houses. So they're bebopping and I'm sitting tight building glorious, glorious world-class houses. Wow. Anyway, that trained me in houses and land development. And when the recession came, we shut the, he shut the whole business down. I stayed friends with him. I built another, I lost a franchise business I bought and uh, I'd learned a lot, but I, you know, whatever, made some mistakes. Fast forward a couple of years later, three years later after the recession, he calls me, we're friends still. I'm not on payroll. And he goes, what would you do if you were me with that hotel I bought? you know, six to tear down. I'm like, man, it's been six years, five years. 
I would sell it. He's like, well, it's not worth what I paid for it. I paid 12 million. It's worth, in my estimate, 8 million. I'm running it with a flea bag operator is just keeping the doors open. I said, well, I don't know, man, let me go down and check it out. So I became a maintenance guy. I was like an undercover boss guy for about a month working for the owner and it's a beach environment. And I came up with this business plan. I said, what if we rebrand it into an iconic name? What if we use it as a franchise prototype like Michael Gerber would do? And what if I try to get sexy appeal by calling trip travel channel it was the height of travel channel and HGTV and I said, what if I try to get one of their celebrities to help me redesign and conceptualize? So I kind of got two or three of those ideas done. I got a celebrity designer, but I didn't get us a show. And I wrote a business plan. I said, what if we could renovate tired old resorts on the Eastern Seaboard that are iconic locations without an iconic hotel? And so that became the brand name. We built a company called Icona, which is Latin for icon. And we became incredibly successful. Not at first. Uh, we took a year's worth of punches, got my balls cooked in. Everything went wrong. Construction was a beast. I put $8 million in my, into construction in seven months. Two years later, we realized it was never about the building. It was always about, always about the way you treat people in the building. It's how a business like a hotel really succeeds. And from that point, we became this mega training company for ourselves. Like We rigorously learned how to train how to deliver hospitality and then becoming the 20 top 25 hotels in the world country in America, wall street journal, USA today, TripAdvisor, And uh, I mean, we were beating out 55,000 American hotels. We were number seven and it was all service, man. And the NOI just skyrocketed, man. We bought, when we took over the building was doing 1.8 million top line. By the time we matured the company three and a half years later, it was doing, uh, it was doing 3 million bottom line. Top line was close to you know, seven and a half. So we were killing it. Now we were getting refis and then a bunch of epiphanies start happening. We bought multiple. And instead of being flippers, we were operators. Fast forward, that family office experience lasted until about three and a half years ago. And three and a half years ago, we were able to liquidate some equity out of that because I earned millions of dollars from sweat equity. And then boom, we built the the empires that we are part of today with hundreds of great people. And we are on the destiny to finish what we started with the last company, which is actually we're on the destiny to hit 100 resort properties or hospitality properties by 2035, you know, incredible returns to our investors, high double digit yields. And there you go. That's what we do now. So uh, that's our whole what story. Are, what is your value proposition in hospitality? Like what are the, you know, you hear about yeah, in uh, hospitality. Yeah. You yeah. You hear about tricks. Some- Yeah, go for it. I want to hear those. Yeah. Yeah. The tricks are we made it through Corona and the pandemic, but uh, right in the middle of a turnaround. So how the hell do you turn around a business in the middle of the world's turnaround? We had early on realized, actually, no, over the course of 10 years of running these really complicated resort operations, I realized that weddings were one of the secret weapons. I wasn't good. We were not good at them the first five or so years of running the first resort businesses. But then we stumbled into it. You know, we got really good. All of a sudden, we're selling 100 weddings a year. We're bringing in millions of dollars that we were were profiting from very high ratio. I'm like, wow. So then we went and found resorts. I said, wait a second. I'm not buying a resort again unless it's, I call it primordial, meaning it it speaks to the primordial man and woman, you know, whether it be near water, near mountain, near vineyard, uh, something iconic that the, that the soul needs, you know, uh, we, we always say, by the way, and if it doesn't have all that, I'll just start a fire with wood and that'll, that'll warm your heart. Right. So primordial type of like world-class w- something that's worthy of time. So the first two properties we've bought in this new group, one is 156 year operating business goes back to the 1800s, never been closed winery resort. The other one is a, is a waterfront in resort near Annapolis, 200 years old. I'm like, well, that speaks to the primordial nature. It's got this legacy, but it's not making money. So what am I going to do? I'm going to add weddings. By adding weddings, and I hope you're sitting down, everybody. By adding weddings, you're thinking, oh, Josh is saying something so self-evident. Just have weddings, you dumbass. No, what I'm saying is by adding weddings, we've de-risked the tremendous volatility of hospitality. If you and I could buy a a house down the street and rent it out at 
normal house rates, or we could buy a house on the water and rent it out at Airbnb rates. And you could only buy one asset your whole life. Which one of those two would you buy, Jamie? I'm buying the Airbnb all day. Exactly. So yeah. we are buying the multifamily equivalent of resorts is like houses versus Airbnbs. Hmm. So I'm like right where you want to be. If you believe in Airbnb, then you'll understand why we're doing this. We got primordial experience, rich resorts like Airbnbs are. We're buying them as if they were an old tired hotel. So we're buying them cheap. We're spending the right money in the right spots. And we're overlaying all of that resort business, millions of dollars, with another five to $10 million of wedding business. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean like a wedding. I mean like five to 12 at the same time on the weekends. I mean, over the course of two and a half days. So we're not doing one wedding a week. We're doing on an average 10 weddings a week. At one resort. One resort, multiple wow. property locations. We're sure, 200 sure. acres. So you got you don't even see each other. And we're bringing in, we've overlaid on top of a normal resort approximately eight to $10 million of brand new revenue. And then that revenue runs at a massive profitability. And you might say, well, that's all pretty cool, but what's the secret? Here's the secret, Jamie. I hope you're sitting down. They sign up to buy that wedding two years ago. Mm. So we actually literally within decimal points, know exactly our profitable rate each month and our revenue each month from now until 2025. Wow. It's really profitable. So you had to believe in that vision two years ago, but now you can show up. You can't get a parking spot. You can't sleep in the hotel for the next two years. You now know we were telling the truth. Weddings are contractual high yield revenue. You overlay that into a wedding, a, a hotel that has live entertainment and thousands of people coming, just go to the bar. And now you just create like a little city of profitability. And then we charge them for everything, right? Hotel rooms, the food and beverage, the bar, fire pits can cost $500 to, for us to light you a fire pit. All of a sudden, everything's a revenue stream. And uh, it's li- and then, of course, there's one other secret. When you signed up to pay us and we took 25% of your cash for the year 2025 now in 2021 or 2023, I should say, um, we took 25% of your money. We now have your money at 0% interest for years, Mm. for years. So it can become, and it's non-refundable. And according to the IRS, it's actually realized revenue now. Um, It goes right into our, our cash flow. And it goes right into the way you could capitalize uh, the development of the project. So anyway, it's so revolutionary and so simple. Uh, it's hard to run, but simple to understand if you just Understood. take it. Understood. Understood. We're coming up on time. So you tell me if we need to kind of cut it in a couple minutes here, because I have two more questions if you're op- open. You for do it. whatever you want, buddy. I'm sorry. I took that one. That was a long one. But Not at I, all. It's really powerful, man. It's really Not powerful. At all. We, we chatted a bit before recording too. So, uh, all right. So on, on this point of investing with you then, so you know, you're, you're obviously not just taking money out of your pocket and buying these properties. You're, you're putting this out to people to invest. You're a syndicator of resorts, essentially. It's a lot yep. of people syndicating a lot yeah. of things nowadays, right? There's a lot of that out there. How are you any different? What makes you different? What makes you better or, or however you want to couch that as a syndicator uh, in your space or just generally speaking? Yeah, not better than anybody, but I do want to preach to those syndicators that are listening. If you do the, if you create Reg D, 506C fund uh, placements and you help investors get on board and buy part of your multifamily or whatever you sell or self-storage, I th- think what I've learned early on in this about three or four years ago from p- peers is that you really are creating a second business. You know, as soon as you create one of those funds, even if they're small, 1 million, 2 million, ours is, are usually going to be 10 to 25 million now. They, they, you've created a private equity office and nobody really talks about that in the universe you and I are in with multifamily. They always, by the way, the one cool thing you'll notice it's subliminal, but I never say we're resort syndicators. I never say we're real estate syndicators. I never say we're multifamily syndicators, which we are capital syndicators yeah. or a, a real estate hedge fund or a real estate private equity group. All three of those are true, but the brand we go with is accountable equity, two words, accountable equity. And we call that our investor community. And so what we realized is that as soon as we took dollars, we were in two businesses. We were in the managing of a portfolio of securities, private securities, in order to enrich your life, Mr. and Mrs. Investor, 
yes, the vehicle we're using is buying value add resorts and creating mega profitability for you. That's awesome. That's like our Viva May. That's our culture training, our incredible skilled architects, a design team. That's that. Don't worry about that. We're, we are working for you. We're your worker bees. Over here, we've put together a really great staff of, of people running accountable equity. So we do things with like education. We do quarterly masterminds. And of course, we pay our preference payments. And of course, we asset manage our fees. But we really kind of realized we were creating the inklings and the beginnings of a, a mastermind that could teach people how to build their own personal family offices, like small, because our investors are accredited. They're not mega wealthy. They're, they're million dollars plus in wealth, but they don't know all the cool things that the IRS code allows you to do to save taxation. They don't know how to get asset protection. So every quarter at one of our resorts, if you're an investor, you don't have to pay. There's like keynote speakers. There's community. There's collaborations. I've had multiple of our investors invest in each other. It's, it's a all boats float world changing model of capital syndication. Love it, man. That's amazing. Incredible. And just what you've built is amazing. You know, from, from humble beginnings all the way through now, I mean, literally, if you're, if you're watching YouTube, you could see behind you an incredible resort, just a beautiful property. The, the spread, I see a fountain back there. It's unbelievable. And one of these <laughs> days is. I will make it, I Find will make it to the, to the winery in Jersey that you have so that I can uh, partake in, in your hospitality. And it's, I, I, I wonder too, when does the hospitality uh, a course or teaching come out as another vertically integrated product. I think it does. No, I'm right? serious, man. No, bro. We own all these kinds of brands about, we'll talk about that some other time, but yeah, yeah, no, yeah, our, yeah. the training, the training is part of our uh, value add. And, and right. the, the way we do it is not only is it seriously profitable, it makes our teams happy. And you know, in the time of the Corona, you couldn't get staff we had hard times, but we never were below staff quantities. We never shut a restaurant down. You know, like, you know, how sections are closed in restaurants. We've yep. never had that because our staff is, is a team. There's an esprit de corps. Anyway, for so many of the investors from GoBundance, probably have 20 investors from GoBundance. Many of them have been here and they totally get it. So if you're listening, high five to you. Thank you for investing with us. Amazing. Well, we're going to wrap this up with a question from the GoBundance card game. This is the three of diamonds. means nothing. Uh, if your five, This question is interesting. If your five-year-old self suddenly found, suddenly found inhabiting... This is worded weirdly. Like if your five-year-old self was suddenly found inhabiting your current body, what would your five-year-old self do first? Drive a car. Absolutely. Drive a car. <laughs> Holy shit, man. Is that not what you wanted to do when you were a kid? That's of all course. I think about. Anything. It, my son talks about Lambos. He's six. Is that what you would go for? What kind of car? I, I just got an affordable SUV from Nissan, dude. The new Pathfinder is freaking the best car it's for the money. It's the best. Not I would bouncy? jump in that. It's a little more. It's more, more trucky. I like that. Okay. Yeah. But I mean, I would jump in that damn thing and go off-roading if I was five years old. <laughs> right now. Right now. And I probably could do it. Amazing. Josh, how do people learn more about you, what you're doing? Where do you want to direct folks? Uh, please come visit us. You can actually come to the event. Hopefully you get this one posted soon. 12th, December 7th. No, December 10th is a Friday all day. Viva May. I'm sorry. The Accountable Equity team is hosting that event. Anybody can come. There is a fee unless you're an investor. Um, and, and otherwise, just hit us up at accountableequity.com. Everything's there, accountableequity.com. Or you and I enjoyed you being on Capital Hacking. If you haven't heard that episode, I think it's like 203. Mm. Oh, and if you're going to listen to Jamie Gruber, you might as well listen to Brandon Turner, who was on episode 200 with David Green, my buddies. I mean, I wish they were more my buddies because they're freaking awesome, but they were yeah. hilarious and powerful on episode 200. You got to hear them. Yep, absolutely. Great, great, great podcast. I love the whole concept of capital hacking. So good for you, man. This has been incredible. I appreciate you coming on. Thanks again for being a, an incredible guest and just pouring your heart out. You gave us so much info, info and wisdom today. So thanks to you, brother. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Phil. We'll see you. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Let us know down in the comments and make sure you hit that subscribe button, hit that notification bell so you can be informed on the next episode and other content right here on this channel. Thank you.